So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's Medical Grand Rounds. I'll begin with a few announcements and reminders. Next week, we will be hosting the Andy and Bev Hansel Endowed Chair in Applied Healthcare Ethics, and we'll be hearing the talk, What's Old is New Again, or Oregon's Advanced Directive Got a Facelift, and Why It Matters to You, and that will be given by Dr. Nick Cockler. We are here today on the Teams live platform for an entirely virtual audience. And this is a partnership between Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland Medical Centers. You can watch with us here live virtually, or you can watch a recording of the event and claim your CME credit. You can access the video through the same link as the invite to today's Grand Rounds. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the session today, so please go ahead and post any comments or questions that you have for our speakers. I will mostly hold those questions until the end of the presentation as time permits. And now I am delighted to introduce uh, our two speakers for today's talk. We are joined by Dr. Mally Nakai, a practicing family medicine physician and primary care provider at PMG North Portland. She leads the Providence Trans Plus Care Providers, a Portland-based group of multidisciplinary providers invested in improving care for trans and gender, gender diverse individuals in the Providence system. Mally is a cis queer identified person whose pronouns are she, her. And we are also joined by Bentley Moses, the senior program manager for the Providence Institute for Human Caring's Trans Plus Health Initiative. Uh, currently based here in Portland, Oregon. They are passionate about advancing health equity through policy and systems change to improve health outcomes. Bentley is a trans non-binary queer person who pronouns are they, them, theirs. And I will now turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us today. Um, so if you haven't already, um, please prepare in a separate web window. Um, at www.menti.com and enter the following code. We'll be using this later uh, in the presentation. So welcome to TransCare 101 um, on this uh, first, uh, on this day of uh, the Pride Month. Um, thank you guys so much for having us. Um, so just briefly, um, I'm family medicine, uh, and um, I have had uh, interest in doing this kind of work since medical school and before. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, and also, please message me or email me if you'd like to join the Providence Trans Plus Care Providers Group. And hi, I'm Bentley Moses. Um, I work for the Institute for Human Caring, which is actually a system-wide uh, group that supports a lot of whole person care work across the system, including our trans health initiative. Um, personally, I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and have lived experience in this topic. So I think to start us off, we're going to begin with a reflection. Um, and that reflection will center the experience of trans people living in their bodies and experiencing their perspectives around transgender identity. So we'll just take about a minute to watch this video and reflect trans. on that. Wow, you don't look trans. I never would have guessed. What does it mean to look trans and why is that a bad thing? Why are trans bodies always compared to the bodies of those who aren't trans? Why is it seen as the end goal not to look trans? I love my trans body. I love the things that make me trans. My scars. My curves. My chest. My voice. My hair. All lack thereof. My facial features. My skin. My Adam's apple. My height. The size of my hands. My wrists. My genitals. My muscles. The life I am growing. Trans people have a chance to see the world in different terms. And defy gender and people's belief of what gender should be. We come in all shapes and sizes. And our bodies may never conform. And that's what makes us beautiful. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not trapped. I'm not pretending to be something that I'm not. 
I'm not a threat to anyone. I'm not less of a man. I'm not any less of a woman. And I'm not stuck in between. I'm non-binary, and that's valid. I'm not any less because of my expression. Because of my body. Or because of your perceptions of me. I'm not living my life for other people. Don't feel sorry for us. I want you to celebrate us as who we are. In whatever shape or form that takes. The end goal isn't to erase what makes me trans. Because there's nothing wrong with being trans. The end goal is to be me. My body is mine. My body is enough. My body is my temple. My body is lithe and strong. Is a work in progress. Is perfect. Is a work of art. Is an ever-changing landscape. Attractive. Amazing. Lovable. Rather beautiful. My body is trans. Thank you, Dr. Nakai. Uh, with that reflection, we are centering the experience of trans people in healthcare. We'll be talking about um, how to care well for folks through gender affirming care, um, but want to really emphasize the human element and the importance of centering whole person in this process. So before we get started, want to ground us just into Providence's mission and vision and how that connects directly to trans healthcare. So as we all know, we're familiar with our mission and vision. As an expression of God's healing love, we are steadfast in serving all, especially those who are poor and vulnerable. Our values center on compassion, dignity, justice, excellence, and integrity. And of course, our vision is health for a better world. These are all directly aligned with caring well for LGBTQIA people. Our sponsors have made a specific call to care well for trans people um, and have set forth guidelines that are used at Providence. And something that we center at the Institute for Human Caring is really the know me, care for me, ease my way promise. And I know this applies across all of Providence. Um, knowing our trans patients, caring well for them and easing their way is really the centerpiece to welcoming environments and providing good care, um, gender affirming or otherwise for LGBTQ patients. <clears throat> so just wanted to kind of start us with that reflection and ground us into our mission and values and how that connects directly to trans care. I'll talk a little bit about our goals for today. So during our conversation, we're going to get comfortable with terminology and definitions, give you an overview of some of the language that's used for LGBTQ patients, um, emphasizing transgender patient care. We're hoping that this helps build empathy for how we care for our patients here at Providence and that folks walk away with affirmative language skills that can support you in providing that care. And then, of course, we're going to spend some time deep diving into the basics of medical treatment for gender affirmation and some of the logistics on things like how to chart an epic um, and what sort of pearls of wisdom you can use in caring well for trans patients here at Providence. And then I think we're going to talk a little bit about history. Yes, so LGBT folks have always been part of society, and at times they've been more accepted and acknowledged uh, than at other times. Um, unfortunately, trans people still face tremendous amounts of persecution, violence, and stigma in our and other societies. Um, and as such, LGBT plus people are more likely to experience minority stress, uh, including higher rates of violence and abuse perpetrated toward this community. And as a result of that and other stressors, trans people are more likely to attempt suicide. 42 to 46% of trans folks will attempt suicide in their lifetime. And this is compared to 4.6% of the general population. A stark difference there. Um, about 20 million adults in the United States self-identify as LGB or T. And it's important to remember that LGBT plus folks are everywhere. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, they continue to face lots of discrimination and while there have been some gains in protection, uh, recently we've seen a lot of really troubling bills in various state legislatures 
that target transgender people and children and limit local protections and allow the use of religion to discriminate. Before we dive into the uh, gender unicorn image, I'm really excited to talk about some language. I just want to emphasize something about the history that uh, Dr. Nakai mentioned. Persecution, harassment, and abuse of transgender people has actually only been more prevalent in recent history. Um, folks have been around for as long as there have been humanity, and uh, we know that we're facing some really unprecedented, challenging times and current events. Um, however, this has not always been the case, and so a return to that equanimity is absolutely possible. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about this beautiful image of the gender unicorn, our gender neutral tool that we use to talk about gender identity, gender expression, uh, sex assigned at birth, attraction. Um, this was an example that the Institute for Human Caring uses from the Trans Student Education Resources Group. Um, it's a tool to help us understand how each of these pieces operate upon a spectrum. Everyone's uh, gender identity expression uh, is upon a spectrum, whether we're transgender, cisgender, or otherwise. Folks might be really familiar with some of these concepts um, and topics and may already be talking about them with patients, but this is a really helpful tool to um, have people identify where they are on the spectrum. Gender identity, which is the blue arrows at the top, is one inter one's internal sense of whether they're male, female, neither of these, or both, or maybe another gender entirely. Um, everyone has a gender identity, including you, everyone on this call. For trans people, their sex assigned at birth and their own internal sense of gender identity are not the same. So you can see, you know, female, woman, girl, man, male, boy, they're not necessarily linked, but these are some of the most common gender identities listed on this slide. Um, second to that is expression, which is in the green arrows. That's a physical manifestation of one's gender identity through clothing, hairstyle, voice, body modification or shape, etc. Um, most trans, many trans people seek to make their gender expression, so how they look, match with their gender identity, who they are and how they feel. This might be different from sex assigned at birth. And sex assigned at birth will be the last one that I'll really dive into. Um, that's the assignment or classification of people as either male, female, female, intersex, or another sex. And that's based on a combination of anatomy, hormones, chromosomes. Um, it's really important that we don't simply say the word sex, so we use sex assigned at birth instead because the definition of sex can be fairly vague and also using the word sex can has a historical place in transphobia, um, gatekeeping about how people identify. Um, chromosomes are most frequently used to determine sex, um, but they don't always, chromosomes don't always determine genitalia, sex or gender, which many of you probably already know. So this is a really useful tool um, to reference in thinking about those pieces on the spectrum. I want to dive into a little bit more of our LGBTQIA terms and some uh, specificity around some of the words or uh, concepts that you might have seen in care or that people might be bringing to you in care. So this slide was borrowed from our partners at the LGBTQIA Center at Swedish up in Seattle. Um, you can see on the chart there's a number of uh, words listed under sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, these are commonly used LGBTQIA terms. I first want to acknowledge that these terms are based in Western concepts of gender, sex, and sexual orientation. And so while they're really prevalent in our culture and the work that we are doing, they don't represent all people's identity or language. So you may run into other ways to uh, describe these constructs. This is also not a complete list of examples. There are resources we'll be sharing with you at the ends of the slide that have more information on different terms. Um, we'll also, I also want to note that the top things that are listed in black are ones that you would be able to find in a sexual orientation and gender identity tool in EPIC. The ones below in blue are not available to be selected. Um, Dr. Nakai is going to talk a little bit more about that tool later. So this is sort of a quick sheet that can help you think through those things. So the most familiar, um, you know, gay, lesbian, straight, bisexual, there on the left, asexual, pansexual, those are um, sexual orientation. So how people might be sexually or emotionally attracted to someone. 
Um, you can see gender identity there in the middle, cisgender, so your gender aligns with your sex assigned at birth or transgender, non-binary. Um, there's additional labels, so like two-spirit, that's a term used for indigenous people in North America. Um, it can be used to describe a person who is considered to embody both masculine and feminine or possibly possessing a third gender. However, I want to emphasize this really uh, varies from tribe to tribe, so it's a, an, important to have the patient self-identify with that topic. And then and there's an umbrella term in the center here, uh, queer which people may have heard used specifically more recently. Uh, this is an umbrella term that is used to describe sexual orientation, gender identities, expressions, and sort of generally anything that falls out of the cisgender heteronormative experience. However, the word is sometimes controversial um, in the community because of its historical derogatory use. So you might find that older generations do not use this word as often. Um, it has made a resurgence as a reclaimed term. Many people do use it now, but there might be sensitivity to that term depending on the population. And then finally, um, just want to highlight intersex. Um, that is a person born with natural variations in their sex characteristics, um, including chromosomes, sex hormones, or genitalia, and it's not strictly within a binary measure of male and female. I would love to invite people to drop into the chat if any of these terms are new or if they're unfamiliar. Um, I know there's a lot of terms that are emerging, and we'll also take a look at pronouns next, which may have some new pronouns for you all. So pronouns are perhaps something that might be um, more familiar to folks. It's really becoming more and more popular, which is exciting to create a welcoming environment by having pronouns listed on name badges or in email signatures or asking for pronouns when patients present um, for care. So we use pronouns all the time without thinking about it. Most people identify with one, but many people, some people identify with multiple, and then there are definitely people that don't use any. Um, the ones we see that are most common are the ones there at the top, so he, him, his, or she, her, hers, um, they, them, theirs, those are my pronouns. Um, I know there's often some confusion around they, them, theirs. There's been discourse over whether or not this is a singular pronoun, but that's not a new concept. Um, singular they, them, theirs has been used actually since the 14th century. We often use it every day actually without thinking about it. So for example, someone left their book on the table, they'll need to pick it up. It'll be difficult for them to practice without it. Um, so using these pronouns and asking people for their pronouns is a really uh, fabulous way to make people comfortable um, and to create a welcoming and inclusive environment. You'll see some of the neo pronouns um, in the center here. They're getting really popular with trans and gender diverse people because of the neutral nature. They um, don't connote any uh, gender identity. There are lots of these. Um, you can Google them for additional information. There's many, many different options. And if people don't use pronouns, um, just use their name. So for example, this is Steve. Steve likes to go to the park. Steve goes there all the time. It might feel a little bit strange, um, just like the singular, just practice, you'll get it. Um, a really good, it, this is a really good way to also make sure you're not using someone's pronoun incorrectly if you haven't asked, or maybe you're unable to ask at the time, um, which absolutely comes up. Sometimes people use more than one. Sometimes you'll see people listing he, they. Um, you can ask how they would like that to be used. Um, it also means that either of those pronouns would be uh, correct. Something I want to emphasize that's written at the bottom of the slide. Uh, if you don't know someone's pronouns, just ask and remember that mistakes happen. That's okay. It's great. Just practice. We're all learning. Apologize, correct yourself, and move on. Um, make it quick and continue to keep trying. And that affirmation can really be uh, life-changing for folks when receiving care. So we've talked a little bit about just basic terminology. There's additional basic terminology resources in our resources section in this slide, but I'm going to give you just a brief overview of some things that can help generally improve services for transgender people that you might be able to apply in your work uh, right now. 
So you can see a few options listed here on the slide. I want to highlight um, the first, which is welcoming transgender people by getting the word out about services and displaying gender positive cues in your office. So things like buttons, posters, stickers, literature, signs that can demonstrate that you are transgender friendly. You can write your intake form to include things like chosen name in addition to legal name. Um, and then you can also leave things like a third blank opt option for people to include their selected sex and gender where they could actually write it in and uh, more accurate, accurately describe their gender. Environmental things like including single use restrooms are a very welcome addition for lots of people for lots of reasons. Um, transgender people are included in that population. And also number two, I want to highlight uh, treating transgender people as they would want to be treated. So this is the platinum rule. We all talk about the golden rule, which is treating others how we would like to be treated. Um, we want to show people the care that they would like to have. And this includes respecting names and pronouns, um, asking and for and affirming those in care. Um, being relaxed and courteous, avoiding any negative facial reactions, um, and speaking to transgender clients really as you would any other patient. Um, again, emphasizing always respect name and pronouns in the context that they are requested. And then finally, if you're unsure about somebody's gender identity or how they want to be addressed, so this is under number four, always just politely ask for clarification. It can be uncomfortable and you might be confused about someone's gender. Um, However, if you let the person know that you're only trying to be respectful, your questions are usually appreciated. So for instance, you could say things like, how would you like to be addressed? Or what name would you like to be called? This really helps facilitate a good provider patient relationship and is important. Um, it's important not to make assumptions about anyone's identity, beliefs, concerns, or sexual orientation. And this is not any different for transgender or gender non-conforming patients. I want to highlight too, um, maintaining people's privacy is really important around this. We'll talk about that on the next slide. So a couple more options on our next slide. Um, this is a little more specific to, you know, clinical care. Um, and we'll talk about, you know, some of the privacy implications around this as well. So in healthcare situations, um, remember to keep the focus on care rather than indulging in questions out of curiosity. In some healthcare situations, information about biological sex or hormone levels is important for assessing risk and drug interactions. But for many health interactions, gender identity is irrelevant. So asking for that information might be entirely irrelevant. Um, asking questions about someone's transgender status, if the motivation is strictly um, to satisfy curiosity or be a teachable moment um, that comes up in some environments, um, and it's unrelated to care is inappropriate and that can quickly lead to a discriminatory environment um, and really make patients uncomfortable. This kind of links to number nine. It's another one I want to call up. Um, never disclose a person's transgender status if anyone does not explicitly need that information for care. Um, this can get complicated. Sometimes patients will disclose their transgender status specifically in one care environment and not want that status come up in other care environments. This particularly can come up for pediatric patients disclosing information about their transgender status if they have not shared that with parents, for example. Um, just as you would like not needlessly disclose a person's HIV status, a person's gender identity is not an item for conversation. Um, having it known that one person is transgender can result in ridicule and possible violence towards that individual. So it can be very serious implications. If the disclosure is relevant to care, please use discretion and inform that patient whenever possible. This, I want to give just a quick example, can come up in things like um, disclosure of pronouns. So um, an example I have permission to share is a provider was observed um, saying, he has shared with me that their pronouns are they. What this does is sort of um, uh, invalidate a patient's experience of transgender by using pronouns that they did not choose to describe them, and also is potentially um, outing a patient um, in an informal environment uh, that wasn't for clinical care. So a couple different layers of maybe what was a well-intentioned uh, delivery of that information, but could potentially be harmful to a patient. So. That's a broad overview of just a few things that you can do to work well and create a welcoming environment to set the stage for some of the things that Dr. Nakai is gonna dive a little bit deeper into. 
OK, so first we're going to come into epic practical tips. Um, so you can document preferred names, uh, chosen names and pronouns in Epic. Um, there's a way under demographics with the squiggly line. I'll show that to you in a few moments. Uh, you can also go through the SOGI navigator, the sexual orientation and gender identity navigator. Um, in the SOGI navigator, you can also document an organ inventory. Um, so if that's applicable, uh, that can be a helpful place to put that. Um, we can also change the sex category in Epic. Yes, that is possible. Um, usually that uh, needs to be congruent with their official uh, government identification. Um, so that may not always um, correlate with their chosen identity. So basically no matter what their ID documents say, we need to call people by the names and the pronouns that they prefer. Um, so uh, and then also there are some workarounds um, with within the problem list um, you could add a problem list item to help keep track of health maintenance um, uh, items. Uh, so feel free to ask or put questions in the chat if you have any questions about that. OK, so next we're going to go to um, some uh, screenshots that um, Swedish was uh, so kind to share with us. Um, so basically, this is how you get to the SOGI navigator. Um, you can see where the little hand is. Um, they've got their chosen name. And then right underneath that, uh, they've got female right here. Um, so to get to the SOGI navigator, um, I think this is the easiest way. And just click on the patient's sex on that storyboard. Um, and also do remember that, you know, some of this, um, some of the uh, voc vocabulary here in Epic is a bit outdated. So um, try to, you know, just use the vocabulary that you know is correct. So once you click on the sex um, category, uh, then this will bring you over to the SOGI navigator and then you click on this edit button in order to get in and that will bring you here. So this is the SOGI navigator. So at the top there where it says preferred first name, you can enter their chosen name or their live name. You know, just ask them what name should I call you? Um, and you can put that in there. Sometimes this will be a little bit different depending on the situation. Perhaps the patient um, goes by one name with you as their trusted provider, and they might go by a different name with the front desk folks. Um, so it's important to make that, that distinction. The name that you put into the SOGI Navigator will show to everyone. So if they're not ready to have that name as something that everyone calls them, then uh, make sure that you put in the, the correct name for them. Uh, for that situation. Um, and then you can also um, scroll down a bit um, to enter their pronouns here uh, towards the bottom. Um, and again, just ask, what are your pronouns? What pronouns should I use? Um, and then this is a continuation of the SOGI Navigator, again, scrolling down farther. Um, basically, for the rest of the SOGI Navigator form, use your clinical judgment. Um, if, the, if it's appropriate and applicable to the care that you are providing, then absolutely add, add this in, ask those questions um, in a sensitive way. If it's not applicable, then you don't need to use it. Um, so a little bit more explanation. Um, so um, if the patient has developed an organ, for example, so organs the patient currently has, um, you can click on, you know, they've developed breasts and uh, they also have a penis and maybe a prostate or, you know, whatever is applicable uh, for them. Um, so you can add that. And then the nice thing about this is that Epic can sometimes translate this into the health maintenance um, and can update the recommendations. Um, and then a few other cool things you can do. Um, you can send the patient a SOGI questionnaire through the MyChart so they can go through this information on their own and add in um, what they are comfortable with. Um, that will also add um, 
their their information uh, into the storyboard in Epic, um, like I mentioned earlier, where everyone can see it. Um, you can also add the chosen name and pronouns uh, to a patient list. Uh, for example, if you're keeping uh, a list of your inpatient uh, uh, on the inpatient ward or uh, you keep a list of you know, other patients um, for other tracking purposes, um, you can add uh, chosen name and pronouns to that list. Oh, uh, there was one thing I forgot to mention. Um, so I'm going to go back one slide. Um, so in the pronouns, um, they have these, you know, preset options, um, and they're not there are not very many preset options. Um, so one workaround, like if patient uses Zazem Zero, for example, uh, you can click on this note slide and you can add their pronouns um, in that uh, text box. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Nakai, I'm going to interrupt just one moment. Um, thank you for sharing um, the, the SOGI section. Um, one viewer was wondering if at the end you'd remind us once more how to open this section. Sure. Um, yes, absolutely. Let me just go back and do that right now because I don't think we'll have time to. So basically, um, you click on the uh, sex category on the storyboard. That brings you to this uh, this view, and um, so you've got the sexual and gender identity um, navigator that's not open yet, and then you click on edit. And clicking on edit will bring you into the SOGI navigator. Okay, and feel free to also reach out to me um, if additional questions come up. Um, I'm happy to answer them offline as well. Um, or, you know, uh, I think we will be able to share this uh, this PowerPoint uh, with you all. So um, that will also be available to you. OK, so uh, jumping into medications. Um, so one thing, one disclaimer that I want to make is that all of the medications that I'm going to talk about, all of the uses of medications are off label. So none of these are officially FDA approved. And we do have um, several, um, several organizations that do put out guidelines, um, such as UCSF and WPATH and the Endocrine Society, um, all put out guidelines um, with, uh, with as much good evidence um, as, we, as we currently have. Um, so when you're talking about medications with a patient, you know, the first thing you want to do is make sure that you discuss and understand the patient's goals. Really, what are their desires with treatment? And patient's goals really vary widely. And so, you know, you may offer some medications and not others based on what they're going for. Or, you know, you may want to lay out all the options and kind of discuss with them what the likely effects of each medication might be. Um, so really understand their goals. Um, and then also you need to understand what the effects and the risks and alternatives are so that you can then explain all of that information to your patient in a way that um, is going to uh, be helpful for their understanding and their decision making. Um, and then of course, please ask, ask for help uh, there, you have lots of resources um, here at, in the Providence EPIC system. Um, you can use one of the e-consults. Uh, we call ourselves Ask OR North Trans Plus Care. Um, so you can send us an e-consult anytime uh, for any questions uh, regarding this care. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary group of providers, like was mentioned earlier, uh, we all staff this e-consult um, and kind of um, refer back and forth to each other. So uh, you'll get anyone from a family medicine provider like myself uh, who's experienced in this care. Uh, you could uh, ask a behavioral health question, a pharmacy question, a pediatric endocrinology question. Um, so we have a lot of different uh, providers involved in answering this e-consult. Um, and then, of course, um, the 
additional resources below um, are also some of my go to resources. I keep the UCSF guidelines page um, as a favorite on my web browser. Um, so all of those uh, are can be very helpful. OK, so first talking about masculinizing medication. Um, so this is basically testosterone. Uh, testosterone can come in many forms. Uh, you can get gels, patches, shots, implants. Um, I usually start with gel or shots. Um, it really depends on what the patient wants. Um, the patches, sometimes people will ask me about these as a starting uh, choice. Um, and often I find that the patches are non-formulary. Um, uh, the gel can be kind of made into patches in a sense, uh, just by placing a uh, tattoo cover uh, over the top of the gel. Um, I don't do implants really ever, um, but they, they do exist. And I do know of some providers here in the Portland area who do implants. Most of the time, insurance does not cover that. Um, and sorry, I'm getting into the pearls. Uh, so, um, so for lab monitoring, um, in the first year, you want to make sure that you're monitoring labs every three months or so, um, as you're going to most likely be making some changes uh, over each, uh, each visit. Um, so the main labs that you want to monitor are testosterone and hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, when someone is taking testosterone. So for maximum uh, masculinizing effect, you want to aim for a goal testosterone, which you know ideally would be taken mid-cycle, and you want that goal, you want that to be in the mid-range. Um, so, uh, and then of course monitoring for desired effects and side effects. And the mid-range is usually anywhere from like 400 to 600 um, on the Providence Lab. Um, speech therapy can be a great adjunct for treatment for any patient. Um, there are a lot of things about speech that, you know, I as a medical provider don't really know and understand. And so um, speech therapy, not only for pitch, but also for uh, speech patterns uh, can be really helpful. Um, and then also you want to ask people about what surgeries they might potentially want either now or in the future. And then you can talk to them about, you know, what that might entail. Um, there's a really nice article uh, specifically on testosterone hormone therapy from UCSF uh, that is referenced there. So a few more pearls. Um, let's see, uh, the gel. Um, so I usually start with gel or shots, like I was mentioning. Um, the gel uh, needs to be fully dry, which can take a long time. Um, and using a tattoo cover um, is, can be helpful, especially if the person is going to be in close contact with other people who don't want testosterone. Um, and then for the shots, uh, cypionate, testosterone cypionate is the most common. It's totally fine to use subcutaneous. In fact, a lot of people find that much more comfortable than the IM. Um, but some of our pharmacies aren't as um, aware of that, and uh, they may question whether or not it's okay to use subcutaneous, but yes, it definitely is. Um, so, and then I already mentioned the uh, maximum effect. Oh, for the h, &H this has come up a couple of times. Um, it could be high um, if someone is uh, having too high of a dose of testosterone, um, but it's actually much more common to have a different reason, like smoking, for example, um, that someone would have polycythemia. So keep other causes in mind. Don't just autom if someone has polycythemia, don't just automatically go to decreasing their testosterone dose. Um, and then for surgeries, um, this is both uh, this is for anyone who's having uh, gender affirming surgeries. Um, for top surgeries, usually only one letter is required. Some providers may require that letter prior to making an appointment. Um, for bottom surgeries, usually two letters um, are required. Okay, and then um, for feminizing medication treatment, um, generally this can be a combination of several medicines. Um, I do have some people who start who 
are only on estradiol um, and, uh, and many people who use uh, multiple different medicines. So estradiol can come in pills, patches, shots, um, an antiandrogen I most commonly use for an alactone, um, but finasteride and bicalutamide are other uh, medications that you may be asked about. Um, and then a progestin, um, there are different, you know, pills, shots, implants uh, for the progestins. Again, in the first year, you want to be monitoring labs about every three months. Um, so for these, I usually, uh, for people who are on estradiol and or antiandrogen and progestin, I usually monitor testosterone, estrogen, and a comprehensive metabolic panel. Uh, the comprehensive metabolic panel is because I also want to make sure that I'm looking at liver enzymes. Um, so for maximum feminizing effect, again, you want to aim for a mid-range of uh, estrogen, um, of estradiol uh, on the labs, so like 200 to 300, and then you want uh, testosterone to be low. Um, and then, of course, monitoring for side effects and desired effects, again, considering speech therapy, asking about surgeries, um, and then that uh, UCSF article below. Okay, um, and then some pearls. So um, the estradiol pills come in um, one or two milligram sizes. Um, they are often um, best if taken split throughout the day. Um, so, of course, if, if someone's on a super low dose, then it might be difficult to split a one milligram pill to twice a day. But if they're on like eight milligrams a day, which is the highest dose, you can split that out into two or three doses per day. Um, the patches, um, depending on which brand of patch, uh, you may do, you know, one or, th or two or three times a week. Um, the shots are usually weekly. Again, um, so the shots usually uh, valerate um, or cipionate are the two main options. And that, um, which one you use may depend on both insurance coverage for the patient as well as what's available. Um, especially in the last couple of years, uh, there have been some shortages. Um, so, you know, for some patients, uh, I've had to kind of switch um, to a different version. <clears throat> Um, but again, the shots can be sub-Q um, or they can be IM. And then for spironolactone, um, you can use actually pretty low doses. You don't need to go as high as the doses for heart failure. Um, and, you know, depending on how low your dose is, you might even be able to get away with a once daily dosing rather than twice daily. Um, finasteride um, is not going to be as effective for lowering the testosterone levels in the blood uh, on the lab work, um, but it certainly can be quite helpful for hair loss. So in patients who want that dual purpose, um, that can be a helpful one. Um, bicalutamide I rarely use. Um, it has some potential safety concerns and needs some additional monitoring, um, but uh, with the like handful of patients uh, that I have on that, um, they find it quite helpful. Um, for the progestins, you might consider starting these a little bit later, basically to mimic natal puberty. Um, we don't have a lot of great data, but a lot of my patients um, and, you know, uh, anecdotally from hearing from other providers, a lot of patients really feel like this helps both with their physical development as well as with their mental health. Um, and then, um, okay, so I already mentioned liver function monitoring. And then um, the other thing to note is that some patients really want their estrogen levels to be super high. Um, and sometimes we have to kind of balance that uh, with the safety risks. Um, there can be, you know, adverse effects like nausea that are maybe uh, a little bit more mild. Um, all the way to having higher risk of blood clots with too high estrogen levels. Um, and then for surgeries, oh, this is one thing that I didn't mention on the previous slides. Um, so OHSU is my main uh, referral resource for bottom surgeries, um, especially for trans feminine patients. Um, but uh, the Meltzer Clinic uh, has also uh, 
come back to Portland recently, and so they may be another resource um, for, for surgeries. Okay, so let's, let's transition. Um, so please set down your pens. Uh, you can dim your lights. And this next uh, piece is a listening exercise. So, and this is from the Teaching Transgender Toolkit. I would like you to imagine with me an average day as a transgender person who is in the process of coming out. Please close your eyes and follow along. If you currently identify as a woman, then imagine that everywhere you go, the people around you treat you as if you are a man. You are expected to act and dress like a man. Everyone refers to you using male pronouns and nicknames. He, him, his, Mr., buddy, dude, or sir. You're expected to use men's bathrooms, locker rooms, and changing rooms. If you currently identify as a man, then imagine that everywhere you go, the people around you treat you as if you are a woman. You are expected to act and dress like a woman. Everyone refers to you using female pronouns and nicknames, she, her, miss, girl, lady, or man. Even though you know in your heart and mind that you are a man, everyone around you sees you as a woman and acts accordingly. You are expected to use the women's bathrooms, locker rooms, and changing rooms. This mislabeling of your gender happens in the morning when the attendant at the gas station says hello. It happens when the clerk at the coffee shop says good morning and asks what they can get you. It happens when the front desk person greets you on your way into your office. While you are at work, your coworkers refer to you using the wrong gender language. They use the wrong pronouns and they expect you to conform to traditional gender roles. You know that they don't mean anything by it. They don't even know how you identify, but still the constant misgendering wears you down. Every day you plan for the day when you will tell them how you identify and want to be addressed, but you keep putting off that day because you are nervous that they won't support you that they will treat you differently or that you might lose your job. After a long day at work, you decide to go to the gym. Before you go, you wait for everyone else to leave work so that you can change into your gym clothes with no one else in the bathroom. The locker room at the gym is out of the question. While at the gym, you choose exercises that might help disguise the parts of your body that are most uncomfortable for you. After you leave the gym, you stop by the grocery store, the pet store, and the pharmacy. In each place, as you interact with the cashiers, they refer to you using the wrong gender language. Afterwards, you go to the restaurant where you're meeting your partner for dinner. In hopes of getting a better tip, the person serving your table tries to be friendly with you and makes a joke that presumes your gender. Your partner sees that this bothers you but knows that there is nothing they can say to make it better and changes the subject. After dinner, you go home and change out of your clothes. You glance in the mirror and are immediately frustrated and disappointed when you don't recognize the person looking back at you in the mirror. Every time you look in the mirror, you are surprised by your reflection because it doesn't match the image that you have of yourself in your mind's eye. You quickly glance away from the mirror and block the thoughts out of your mind. So take a moment now to reflect on how you're feeling. And when you feel ready, uh, please feel free to open your eyes. And then we will kind of uh, discuss or if you would put in your uh, um, some of your feelings. Um, I will show this on the screen here in just one minute. 
Thank you, Dr. Nakai, and I will just interject that I know Menti was blocked by um, for some people uh, oh, with no. the firewall, so you can access, access it on your phone or a different browser. Feel free if you are comfortable uh, sharing your comments and our Q&A on the presentation. We can also watch for them that way. And I apologize. I'm also having some technical difficulties here, so. Um, I think it's not going to allow me to share. Oh, here we go. Um, okay, so I think voting is now open and I will try to move this over so you all can see. Okay, so yeah, it's um, it's there can be a lot of emotions that come up with um, that reflection. Um, so thank you for sharing, and thank you all for listening to this presentation today. Um, I look forward to having hearing some questions. Great, thank you. Um for ending with that reflection. I know many of us are holding thoughts, even if we couldn't share them. Um, certainly many emotions and thoughts coming forward. Um, we do have some questions also, um, so I'll go ahead and run through some of those. Feel free to continue to post any comments or questions. Uh, and so first off, um, when, uh, you referenced the letter uh, for potential surgeries. Uh, some of our providers wondered um, who is it that provides letters for top and bottom surgery and what is important to include? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so generally those letters come from a mental health provider. Um, ideally, they would be a mental health provider that the patient um, knows and um, has a relationship with, um, but not all mental health providers um, have the knowledge and understanding uh, to write these letters. The actual text of the letters is fairly simple, basically, um, and actually uh, any, any mental health or uh, primary care or medical provider can look up um, like templates for a quote WPATH letter. Um, but it's basically saying that this person does have gender dysphoria or, um, or an equivalent uh, diagnosis um, to support their need for gender affirming surgery. Um, and also the other piece of that is essentially making sure that um, the patient understands what, what a surgery could entail and has the support that they need um, as far as recovery uh, from that surgery. So um, the letter itself is fairly simple, um, but um, figuring out who to write the letter can sometimes be a little bit more complex. Um, for those cases where someone needs two letters, generally if they already have a therapist who is comfortable writing the first one, I'll generally recommend that that therapist writes one. And then um, many of the Providence um, behavioral health psychologists, um, often the, one, the folks who are embedded in the uh, primary care clinics, um, many of those folks uh, have been trained and do feel comfortable uh, writing second letters. Um, usually it will involve uh, you know, a visit or a couple of visits uh, with them. Um, but that is another resource. And then there are also uh, several um, therapy clinics around town uh, that could also 
uh, be a potential resource for that. And that's a great a great way, like if someone uh, is not sure where to go for those letters, um, uh, using the e-consult is a great way to uh, get some ideas that are more specific to each patient. Great, thank you for all of those helpful details. Um, another comment here, for most patients, their sexual and gender identity information is already filled in by the time I'm seeing them, even if they are a brand new patient uh, in EPIC. And who fills this in? Is that populated automatically? I think you need to come off of mute, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Um, it's not usually populated automatically. Someone has to put in um, their their um, pronouns and um, and their chosen name. Um, often the person who does that is the same person who talks to them first. So whether that's from the new patient call center um, or the person uh, at the front desk at your office. Um, yeah, so any of those people could be doing it. Um, and also not everyone uh, is trained on how to use the SOGI Navigator correctly. So it may not always be correct. Um, if I, I would recommend that you um, confirm with your patient, uh, you know, if it is correct. Uh, there was another piece that I was gonna say, but anyways, yeah. So it, you can always update it more later. And also, like I was saying, you can send the, um, the SOGI Navigator questionnaire to your patient via MyChart. So um, it's possible that I, the new patient call center um, occasionally will do this. Thank you. Um, and a question here, are you or is anyone able to advise on how a person could add pronouns on our ID badges or in Epic as a provider? Bentley, do you want to speak to this one? Are you more up to date on that? I was going to say the ID badges, um, there is hopefully pretty soon here going to be a, a rollout of some pronoun pins that will be available and actually organize the first region that you'll be able to receive those pronoun pins. Um, I think the timeline's still been moving a little bit, but this fall um, those pins will be available and you can add your pronouns. Um, you can also update your information and I'll drop a link actually in the chat as to how you can update your name on your online profile as well. So patients could see that through email, things like that. Thank you. Um, and we will certainly be sharing some resources in our follow up uh, email to claim CME credit. Uh, so just so our audience is aware, we can share some of that through email. Um, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. I have a paired couple of questions um, specific to uh, pronouns um, and probably related to the SOGI Navigator. So one is um, if someone has X listed as sex on their driver's license, is there a way to document that in Epic? And then maybe could you explain a bit more to the audience about the Neo pronouns? Um, I can. So if someone has X listed, um, I believe that you have to um, free text that in to the SOGI Navigator. I can confirm. I mean, my I have X listed on my identification and that is how um, that's had to have been documented. Um, there was a second question about the pronouns and the neo pronouns. I highly recommend, um, I can send you know, some additional links. I think there's links in our resources that are available. Um, looking them up, um, there's some great resource sites that talk about them in more detail. They are popular because they are uh, a little more disconnected from what our constructs of gender are. And for many trans people, they don't identify as male or female within that binary, perhaps as an entirely different gender altogether or as a compilation of those genders. And so those pronouns speak more authentically to that experience. Um, they might be uh, more challenging for someone to practice to learn, but like any other language change practice, it's just the, the part that makes it easier. Thanks so much for that clarification and just for the wealth of knowledge that both of you um, bring to the presentation today. 
we are at the top of the hour um, and want to say thank you um, for your expertise and helping all of us to be better caregivers. Um, we'll look forward to sharing some of these additional resources and you can always rewatch this talk uh, on video as well. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Brad.